guys, welcome to, I, I, we called this one just for the LUFS, or just for the laughs, because it sounds like laughs, and, but mastering is a serious business. So we're here again with, e, we've got Ian, who we just heard from, um, and we're here with Cicely Bolston as well, who was shortlisted for the Music Producers Guild Mastering Engineer of the Year in 2021. Cicely's body of work includes early releases from saxophonist Nubia Garcia, albums from alternative and post-rock bands, Palace, Kinder, and vinyl remasters are simply read in Funeral for a Friend, which is great because some of my questions involve vinyl, so that's going to be um, very useful today. Okay, so mastering is... That's the question. So let's begin with that one, because there's, going to, there's people of all various levels of, of production, um, and let's start with what is mastering? Okay, so I have three. Making the music sound the best that it can be. That's the short and sweet version. Um, it's like Photoshop for audio. So that's another the second one. So in, this, in the same way that you might use some red eye correction or tweak the color balance of a picture before you put it online or uh, put it in a <coughs> photo album or whatever, um, or maybe you know use the clone tool to take out a rogue blob of food. Um, on your clothes because you're a really messy eater like me. Um, in the same way with the audio, you might tweak the the dynamics, which is kind of like contrast and brightness, or the EQ, which is a bit like the colour of a photograph, so the amount of bass and treble for, for music. Um, and you might take out thumps, clicks, pops, um, which is kind of like taking out the rogue blob of food. And there's, I mean, there's literally a tool... Um, called Retouch, made by Cedar, um, where you can see the music displayed as a picture and you just go in and draw, draw around it and get rid of that. Isotope let, RX lets you do the same thing. So that's my second um, option. And then the third one is just to say that you need to meet the technical requirements of the delivery format, whatever that might be. And maybe Cicely could talk a little bit about yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, my main definition is basically your numbers one and three is sound, making something sound, making music sound as good as possible for its intended format, ideally. So you kind of, you've got to have a bit of an awareness of who's going to be listening and how they're going to be listening and the format that it's going to go out on um, while trying to bring out the best in, in the music as it's arrived to you. Um, it's the final stage of the whole process, so it arrives to us quite, quite finished in lots of ways. You know, it's normally a sort of, well, for me... Atmos aside so far, um, I'm sure we'll touch on that later, but uh, you know, it often arrives as a stereo WAV, so nominally could be released as it is, but um, the sort of surprising amount you can do to manipulate it um, and yeah, bring out things, maybe push some things a little bit aside, make it sound good in the knowledge that it will be compared to other tracks, other bands, other, you know, especially now in the age of playlisting, that's quite a big one, um, having awareness of, of what, who else it might be played up against, um, and just to make sure that, you know, it's going to sound not the same, but just <coughs> intentional <laughs> compared to that other track. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, I'm not saying we make everything sound the same, it just um, make it sound as good as it can do in bring out the vision of, um, whoever was creating it, the artist, the producer, the mix engineer, or all of them together, um, and uh, yeah, make it ready for release. Right. In a so, so in a sense, I'm, I'm going to try some weird analogies here. If it's like if building a house is mixing, then mastering is rendering the house. <laughs> and the, what kind of like putting the, that much <laughs> about building anyone knows about building you'll get this, you'll get the, this. the way that I do mastering I might take a few walls out yeah. right. kind of, you know just sort of stretch it a little bit and... I feel like the yeah, visual analogies are like it maybe for a film it's a bit like grading yeah. where you can really change mm -hmm. yeah. the kind of perception with ostensibly quite a small as a filmmaker I should, have, I should have used that yeah. analogy really <laughs> rendering in that sense yeah absolutely um, so um, in terms of at what point in the production process, you're talking about the, the thing you do at the end, is that always the case with mastering or is it something you can consult with? You can definitely consult. I mean, yes, it usually is done at the end um, because 
you know, I mean, in, in an extreme case, you might have something where the mixes are so good that you don't need to do anything to it. So then it's just literally, as I mentioned, about hit, hitting the specifications of the format. So, you know, there are certain requirements for vinyl, certain requirements for CD, um, requirements for or things that are advisable for streaming, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you don't touch the sound at all. Um, but usually there's something that can be done to, to help it out. Because one of the big things about it is is taking a step back and looking at the whole thing. You know, if you if mixing is about balancing the channels in a mix to make a song, mastering is like balancing the songs in a group of songs to make an album or a playlist or yeah. uh, whatever. Um, having said that, you can start talking to a mastering engineer or thinking about mastering at, at pretty much any stage, and you should. You know, there's, I mean. We, I mentioned the loudness wars, and I've been talking about loudness and dynamics for years. Some people send me things where they they, they proudly tell me I've used no compression at all, and I oh, okay, yeah. that's probably going to be a problem because compression is a fundamental part of creating a modern pop yeah. sound. And if you leave all the heavy lifting to the mastering stage, then you're going to be in in trouble. So I think, especially if you haven't done it before, starting a conversation with a mastering engineer really early, most of them I'm sure would be open to you sending them an early mix. Giving some feedback and have you know having a dialogue. Um, right. Communication is really key. Yeah, basically, communication is is yeah. really key, and and um, we're the final stage, but we're well, I am and I know Ian as well, like part of the whole process. So I'm not necessarily interested in someone in never talking to the person whose music it is, you know, or That's or the just worst thing. yeah, because it's not. It's not my music, <laughs> it's theirs, and I want them to feel like I've realised yeah. their vision um, or helped them in some way. You know, I'm sort of trying to put my stamp on it, as, as it were, uh, offering my opinion and my expertise. Some mastering engineers do. I'm the same. I My, my goal when I'm doing work is to, to be invisible. You know, I don't want anybody listening to what I've done saying, oh, listen to the mastering compression on that, <laughs> or wow, what fantastic dither he used, or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> I want people to be listening to the music and just thinking, oh, I love this song, or it makes me sad, or it makes me want to dance, or whatever. Yeah, well, that, that was a question I had. Do mastering engineers have their own stamp? Can you tell one from another by listening to it? I don't know whether you can tell one from another. Some of them... I think some of them do, yeah. Um, I don't think maybe maybe someone maybe, yeah. can say, oh, I know that that's a, this person master or that person master. I think maybe... Um, of old, as it were, you could more because mastering, often mastering engineers had bespoke equipment. Uh, they would be doing quite different things with the sound at a time when um, maybe there wasn't a sort of, objective is the wrong term, but there's kind of sounds that you need a, a pop mix or whatever a pop song to sound like or X kind of music. There's a lot of creativity within individuals, but you can, if you want to, try and tie into that kind of sound. Whereas back in really the early days, you know, 40s, yeah. 50s, 60s, there was, I think, a lot more kind of um, creativity or a lot more difference than maybe then, because I remember my old mentor, Ray Staff, always saying that he loved Doug Sachs' masters, you know, and he was the, his favorite of all time. Um, but I think that's partly because everything was going to vinyl then, so there wasn't this kind of uh, immediate comparison, mm. so there wasn't so much kind of Specification of yeah, knowing that stuff is going to be immediately yeah. played out next. So, so it's, it's to be to be uh, to be um, to reflect what the artist wants to, to yeah. sound like in that sense. Yeah. So with the mixing engineer, some of us the students here will be budding mixing engineers. When they're mixing, should they be like trying to make it sound like a finished thing, almost like a mastered thing, or should they be a little careful? Because you said. I've got a mix with no no compression mm -hmm. on. You're like, well, that's not going to be. I f this is going to be, an perhaps unhelpful answer, but it's up to you. You know, yeah. it's your mix. <laughs> like, you should feel enabled to make it sound exactly how you want it to to sound. Um, I, and mastering can be, uh, can make a huge change, can make a small change. But if you sort of, if you remember why defining it as bringing out the, the best in music is an important definition to not define it by we always do X, Y and Z to the master, we always turn it up 6 dB or we always make yeah. it brighter. That's not helpful because, because that doesn't take into account how the music has arrived to you. Um, so if 
a mix engineer could feel like it was a finished, then they made it sound exactly like they wanted. They could take it to a mastering engineer that they trust and they want to collaborate with, and they might still bring something to the whole process that, that they haven't thought about. And that's the kind of the joy, as it were, yeah. of, the, of the collaboration and the kind of uh, creative process. Um, so I think with mixing, or I always try and it's just make it sound exactly how you want your mix to sound. I, I, I'm not um, keen on telling people to take things off the mix bus unless it's something that's doing a technical. Mm -hmm. So if people have to put a limiter on doing <laughs> a technical job of making it sound loud, great, please remove that. But if they've yeah. done something that they feel is a creative choice, then great. Yeah, that, no, I'd, I'd agree. I mean, it's a it's a tricky question because there are some of the biggest mixes in the world are now saying in public that they don't like the effect that mastering has often had on their work, and as a result, they're trying to get it so that there's nothing is necessary. And there's a there's a popular kind of meme that's been doing the rounds saying, "What was it? Record as if you're mixing, mix as if you're mastering, or and perform as if you're recording." You know, so the idea is always be one stage ahead and thinking of the next thing. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. But I think also you need to be careful. I mean, let's say your goal is to, for something to be super loud. Um, the tools are out there. Everybody can get hold of decent compressors and limiters these days to do it. The question is whether, well, there's a famous saying by Bob Katz, another mastering um, guru, if you like, which is it's not how loud you make it, it's how you make it loud. So. There have been times when people, so to give you a concrete example, quite often people will send me a mix and I listen to it and it's already super hot. I'm not <clears> gonna go <throat> back immediately and say, don't do that. That's their mix, that's what they wanted. So I'll do the best that I can. And then I'll send it back and I say, I thought the mix was really, really hot. And I'm curious as to whether I could get an even better result if I had a little bit less of that and I had more right. room to work with. If that's an experiment you're interested in trying, I'd love to give it a go. But if this is what you want, and you're happy with the master, then we're done. When I do that, 100% of the time, literally, I've never had somebody send me a less cooked version that I haven't got a result that everybody was happier with. You know, I get something that they're like, that's like ours, but even better. So, and that's to do with the accuracy of the monitoring and mastering, because you've got to hear things really clear. It's to do with the perspective, it's to do with the experience of the engineer. But it is very much, you know, a choice. You know, it's. Yeah. I'm not saying somebody you must do that. It's like this is an option if you want to explore it. <clears throat> um, I think, you know, speaking personally, because I've got such a good success rate with that, I kind of feel like you're better off not to push it too hard in the mix. You know, yeah. do everything else, and if it's just extreme loudness that you need, at that point, have the conversation with your mastering engineer. If they need you to do more in order to achieve it, they'll tell you. Yeah. You know, um, but probably they can get there. Yeah better and cleaner than you can in the mix stage. So delivering de de delivering a, a file for a mastering, okay, so is is minus 6 dB full scale what you want? Do you care? Well, what's the, where, where do you, I mean, obviously you care, but like, where, what's the limit? Because I've been Should we say it together? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Don't clip it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Don't go too loud. Minus 6 is a great, is a, is a nice rule of thumb. And if you're, if you're really far below that, you know, you've got to think about how much gain we're trying to make. Mm. You know, even if you're coming up to a really nice dynamic, not super loud master, if your mix comes in at minus 20 dBFS yeah. or something, me trying to turn up to 20 decibels is, is a lot, or 10 or whatever, yeah. it's quite a lot to do on the stereo. Whereas uh, it comes down to gain structuring, um, is quite so minus six is a useful yeah. frame yeah. of reference, but it's not. A target per se, it's not, you know. Minus six used to be a standard for the BBC. Is that and where it came from? I, th I think so. Um, and and they, the, the, the reasoning behind that was if you set it up to minus six during the rehearsal, it might hit minus three during mm. the performance because everybody plays louder. Yeah. You know, talking about live sessions, which is, you know, peel sessions and stuff. Yeah. It's very unlikely to actually hit zero. Mm. And hitting zero is one that you want to avoid. So if you received a mix that was minus 0.1 dB, would you be a bit like, hang on a minute, this is... Depends how it sounds. Okay. Yeah, depends how it sounds. Depends who sent it. Right. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're also providing a service. <clears throat> so some people, I can turn around and usually, say, actually, usually why you can tell. One? You know, you look yeah. at it. It's it's not so much where it peaks. It's yeah. it's how it hits the peaks. Yeah. You know, if it's a few spikes that go up to, then fine. Yeah. If the whole thing is banging up against yeah. zero, 
that's when you start to think, mm, okay, yeah. I need to listen more carefully. Yeah, this. maybe that's a discussion to be had. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what would a typical, so um, what's, what is a mastering chain and what is a typical mastering chain if there is such a thing? Uh, so I'll go first. Currently, my mastering chain is completely in the box. It's completely digital. So I was trained in 93, 94. And at that time, it was really cool to have DDD on your CD. <laughs> CD is a circular silver disc that you put in a player <laughs> and it plays music at you. Um, and DDD stood for digitally mixed, no, digitally recorded, digitally mixed and digitally mastered. And these days, nobody wants that. Um, <laughs> however, that's how I was trained. And I've been getting results like that. I mean, actually, it's not strictly true. I, I did use some analog gear early, early on. I think the whole analog digital thing is a complete red herring. So for me, the advantages of being in the box in terms of control, flexibility, recall, all that stuff outweigh um, the benefits. I mean, it's really nice to have lovely analog hardware and to, to be able to use it, but it has to be maintained. You know, you have to, it has to be calibrated, it has to be set up. So it's, it swings and roundabouts. So I, if somebody wants some kind of particular analog flavor, then I'll usually hire it in. Right. Um, so I'm happy I to say, do to play that. was advocate, isn't that something that someone who like who works in the box would say? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No. Of course. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, that's your workflow. Yeah. That's the that, yeah, no, so I was going to say, that's my workflow, and I know yours what is different. You? So mine's a bit different. Um, uh, my workflow, well, not that different. I have a range. I do use analog, but not on everything. So it's a kind of bird's eye view on a mastering chain, would probably include some kind of EQing, some kind of compression, and some kind of limiting. But 100% depends on the project and depends on the outcome and the output format and mm -hmm. things um, as to what I'm trying to achieve. But those are kind of the, the rough areas. And there are things that are hybrids of both. Different compressors have a slightly different EQing effect. You know, yeah. so there's lots of crossover yeah. there. Um, I don't tend to use one thing all the time. Um, I kind of will have try and always have a few different options. Which and do you start with? Do you start running out through an analog chain or do you start in digital and so then? So the way that my room is currently set up is I have to start running out through an analog chain and it's quite hard to listen. It's not hard, but it doesn't quite work to do then the digital side of the mastering afterwards. So I just run out the analog and decide whether the analog path at all, everything has a small effect. The fun thing about mastering is that you are really dealing in small differences. You can make a big difference to the sound in quite small processes, but you know nothing that I do is going to be as big as whether you have a guitar solo or a saxophone solo. Mm. Well, you know that's not my domain. So often, sometimes we get accused of being in the sort of audiophile land by people for whom that's a derogatory term. I don't know why, um, but it's because we're dealing in small differences yeah. anyway. So if you're if I go out to our analog and actually even just the process of going out and back in is doing something that I don't like it's not achieving the end, then I won't do it because why would I be working against myself? Um, so I have an analog path, I have a couple of EQs, uh, a compressor, a kind of harmonic distortion thing. Mm -hmm. um, I try them out, I know them all quite well, so I will already have an idea of whether I want to use them or not, um, whether I think they're going to work or not, but I still try them, depends how much time I have. Um, depends if I think it's a borderline or not. Um, and then I come back into the digital, do much more kind of forensic mm -hmm. type um, changes because you have that greater control. You have, uh, you know, different types of phase alignment on your EQs and things like that. These are all possible to do in the digital domain. Uh, and I do my final limiting and level in, right. in digital. Um, so yeah. with that, just put your hands up if you know what limiting is. Nearly everybody. <laughs> okay. For the benefit of these two over here. Oh, oh sorry, I won't point anyone out. For the benefit of uh, some random people in the room, um, just tell us what it does. What it is. Uh, it's it's a compressor with very fast attack and release times and a almost infinite ratio. So basically, it will just reduce the peak level of the audio. So the the a good example is if you think about. If any of you have ever tried recording a gunshot for a film soundtrack or just, you know, or, or hand claps or a snare or anything really percussive, if you record it cleanly, it has a massive spike at the beginning and then it decays quite a lot. The loudness of that sound is not in the spike. That's just the, the bit. I mean, in fact, when you, if you record a gunshot, 
it doesn't sound like the intro or the the lobby scene in the matrix no. it sounds like a hand clap yeah. it just sounds yeah. completely lame and, and useless so a classic use of a limiter would be to squash down the peak so that the, instead of that huge spike you have a little and then you have this decaying part then you can lift the whole thing up without clipping and the loudness bit which is the oof sound of the gunshot or yeah. the snare or whatever it is can be much much higher without right. causing distortion right. so limiter is just a clean way of doing that okay so when mastering a track what is there a rule on how much gain reduction is there a, what's the point where you go that's too much um i you can you can hear it yeah often and i guess we'll come on to that subject with, with luffs and measurement yeah. but a use an interesting thing to try if you have access to a limiter at all is to put it on and keep turning it up and at some point you'll find that the track isn't perceivably any louder it just sort of sounds worse in a sort of undefinable way and every mix every recording every whatever will have a different point at which that happens yeah. and there are sort of tricks as it were you can yeah. do to to sculpt the sound so that you can and make it sound perceivably yeah. louder but you are making more and more drastic changes yeah. to the overall sound in order to keep that i think no, there isn't a limit, but for me, most limiters, when you get more than three or four dBs of gain reduction, that's, you know, if, if I'm, so I, I don't pay any attention to my limiter at all when I'm working. In terms of the chain, it's there at the end, mm -hmm. it just sits there. I bring the level up into it, I'm doing my EQ and my compression, and when it's sounding the way I like it, then I might take a glance at the limiter and see how much gain reduction. Right. If, if it's three or four, I might kind of just pause and listen, and I'll do a loudness match comparison. So one really important thing you do when you master is most things get louder, um, even if it's just a bit, and even small changes can make it sound different. So it's really important when you compare the after with the before to turn the after one back down so that you've got a fair comparison. Right. It's one of my big things is about loudness matching. When you do that, then you listen and you think, does it still sound better? And if it does, yeah. it's probably fine. Um, and if it doesn't, then you start adjusting things to, okay. to improve things. So we're going to get into loudness in a moment and loudness units and whatever. Mm -hmm. But before we do, um, if you're mastering an album, how do you? I mean, how do you approach it? If some, if the someone's going to release a single before they release an album, before the album's finished mixing, what is that? What's that process like for a mastering engineer? Is it frustrating, or do do, do you try and master an album in one so, go, or how does it work? Ideally, for an album, it would be great to get the whole album yeah. beforehand because often what happens when you get one song is you do what you do that's fine you bring it up to a level that feels right that feels natural and then you get the album and there's a track three tracks later that is four times as big in its arrangement it needs to be much louder and the level that you've got that one track to already you, you've, you've gone past what the natural sort of yeah. loudness has it were of that track. So you want this track to be actually quieter because it's a piano ballad or yeah. something. Um, and that can be quite difficult. Uh, in the real world, very often people do send you one song and then they say, oh, by the way, now's the rest of the tracks on the album and you just sort Which of might be quite manage. common these days with people doing bits at a time that they mm. can afford to do, perhaps. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's got to the point where I actually don't accept new clients who only want one song mastered. Oh really? I got it so I found it so frustrating because because the first song always takes the most time. Yeah. And my experience I, I used to and I would do this first song and what I found was that the clients who only wanted one master at a time would give you one song and then it'd be three years and they'd give you another song. Whereas so my initial response when somebody says, Can you master a song for me? is no, I only do it in groups of three or more. If they ask really nicely, then I'll usually bend the rule because it's basically just a filter to get rid of those people who are doing one song every right. three years. Yeah. Right. Um, when they do, I always explain, I say okay, look, this is what I'm going to do with it now, but you're telling me it's going to be part of an album. When it's part of an album, we might well tweak it. Probably not a huge amount, but a bit. So you warn them in advance. Um, okay. And, and yeah, you have to... There's, it doesn't make any sense to master a song and then plonk it in the middle of an album and yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. You know? So you, and you try not to shoot yourself in the foot by making something that's going to probably be quite yeah. super loud, but it all depends on the client and the... So I'm going to be careful, sorry, you were going to say... No, something. I was going to say, yeah, exactly. Right. Try not to shoot yourself in the foot, but sometimes... Because I was just about, yeah. maybe going to shoot myself in the foot mm. here, but did either of you master a false total life forever? <laughs> Good, because then I have to make a comment. Oh, yeah. It's a very celebrated album, and uh, but I, I hear massive, massive gulfs of difference mm. in, in the way the songs are presented, and I think it's in the masters. Have you looked into the credits? Have they all been done by the same person? I did, I didn't go that That's far. It. 
Oh, it's just great. It's interesting. Yeah. I've got the same comment about the, I don't know if it's the latest Foo Fighters album, but the one that had the song Run on. Mm. Run came out and I was really excited because, oh, there's a Foo Fighters song with some yeah. decent dynamics. <laughs> And then the album came out, and I'm not going to say it sounds bad, but it does sound very inconsistent from song to song, to the right. point where I'm kind of like, oh, I'm just going to turn it down. And that, for me, is one of the fundamental things to get right in, in mastering. Even yeah. if anything else is wrong, you don't want people reaching for the volume control. No. You want yeah. it to listen through. So this is just a quick one, but Chili Peppers has just released an album that they claim has got no compression on it or anything mm. like that. What's your, what's your take? I haven't heard it yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I need to listen because I've seen the comments. I've seen some people saying... What he specifically said is that there's no lame digital compression right. on it, <laughs> which I take to mean then. that it was mastered in analog. Yeah. My guess is there's a ton of compression on it in the recording yeah. and mixing stage. Yeah. Um, hopefully it's not as loud as their previous stuff because their previous stuff has been way too loud. Yeah. And going back to your previous, just briefly, yeah. your pushback about isn't that what an in-the-box person yeah. would say, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Oh, well, and also about whether you can identify a mastering engineer. I don't think you can listen to something and go, oh, that was mastered by X. But quite often you hear something and then somebody tells you who it was mastered by, and you go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Right. Um, but the other thing I was going to say was um, uh, dub effects are playing somewhere around here soon, I think. Um, the guy who is fronts that is insane. So he got, I think, 16 different places to master him a demo song, including me. Um, and I won. Oh, right. And that included <laughs> all the top London facilities, um, which I'm chuffed about, but also makes me think, you know, no analog gear needed there. For him, yeah. for that material. Oh, I don't think you'd be able to listen to a master and say that was done with yeah. an no, analog you, you, stage no, you, or no, a you, you know. Exactly. It's not. Because yeah. you have no idea That's how the other it's thing. arrived. You, at the you give the same thing to multiple different people yeah. and left to their own devices. Hmm. I mean, I've done this in the past. I've done demos and then I've heard other people who've done, and there's, you know, there's a hair between yeah. them, you know? Similar loudness, similar EQ balance, because ultimately there are the best sounding albums in the world out there. And that's what we would all like to work on and what we all want everything to. So, you know, it's, Especially when you loudness match, the differences between mastering engineers, they're there, but they're not right. as extreme as some people might make you believe. Cool. Well, let's quickly, because we've, we've been talking a little while, let's go quite quickly. Um, let's look at a thing called, well, let's look at loudness units or, or LUFTS, L-U-F-S. What is it? Um, we know it's just a, a measure, a perceptive measure of loudness. Is that right? Mm -hmm. It's a measure of loudness that includes perception as an, as an element. Right. To some extent. Sense. Yeah. <laughs> so, in the streaming online streaming environment, we have lots of, I don't know, lots, but there's different delivery expectations. Um, I've heard, like, so for example, Spotify is claiming, say, we want everything mastered at minus 14 LUF. Right? They don't, they yeah, don't actually they, say that. Do they, they not? That? No, no. Minus 14 is the middle band of three. Yeah. Ian is definitely an expert on this, but please let me go for, <laughs> for a second. For um, middle band of three normalization levels that Spotify that you can set. Minus 14 is the normal if you if you don't go in and mess with the things, the settings, if you can't go in and change normalization, turn it on and off. It is in your settings if you've got Spotify premium. Um, but minus 14 is the, is the middle of three band. It's got a louder setting that's minus 11 and a quieter one that's like minus 23 right. or something. So they don't say that that's what things should be done at. That is just the level. Okay, what they actually say is if you don't want the level changed, mm. minus 14 is the place to go, mm. right? Right. So if you master at something other than minus 14, the level might go up or down, but you're free to master however you like. Okay. Right? But by default, they will, if you're above minus 14, then they will turn stuff down. So it's... it's so if it's not worded terribly well, I have to say, on their yeah, site. No, you're right. But, but, but actually, and, and, and that's where a lot of the confusion comes from. Mm. Go on, ask so, no, so let's just clarify, it's not a loudness target, right? Mm. It's not a loudness, no. And, it's it's and there shouldn't be loudness targets. Or should well, be? we were actually just discussing this before one. It, what's the use of it? The, it? the nice side of it is that you, you know that that is where stuff will get played back at. So you can make an informed decision on on how loud you can make something in the knowledge that if it goes above minus 14, it will get turned down. Every bit of processing you do has an effect on the overall sound. Uh, most importantly, um, not most importantly, but you know, limiting and making it louder has a big effect on the sound. And so if you turn something up and turn something up and get it to, yeah, minus six, there you have that. How do you do that anyway? I've, I've, without, <laughs> yeah. without, without gain reduction, it's uh, giant. You put up with loads of distortion. Just, you put right. up with loads of distortion, yeah. Or pumping artifacts yeah, or whatever. Exactly. 
has a big effect. And you take all the base out and um, all that stuff. And then you know that it's still going to be payback at minus 14. So all, all of the all of the artifact, all of the distortion and all of the things that you had to do to make it that much louder, you sort of, you've lost the the reason that you were doing that, which was for the game. So you, you're just right. left with all the distortion, but none of the game. Right. So if the distortion is part of the sound of the track, you know, and that's something that you liked, the pump pumping, and you wanted that sound, fine. You just, but you know that it'll be turned down when it gets played back. Cool. It's, um, you've mastered for vinyl, mastered for vinyl. Okay. Well, not cut. I've, yeah. done, right. I've done masters that have been sent for cutting on vinyl, and people have told me they're cut flat, which makes me think that if I was mastering for vinyl, there wouldn't be a huge difference. But I haven't actually cut vinyl, which is yeah. a whole other thing. Yeah, so that's the point of clarification. Technically, because I'm allowed to be very specific about this, because I do cutting, a vinyl master is a physical disc that is sent to a factory, and it's part almost the first stage of the manufacturing process, as opposed to the last stage of the sort of music making process. Um, more often than not, when we're cutting vinyl masters, we're doing that from WAVs, yeah. the, the WAV master, often the digital master, um, which may have been done by us, may have been done by someone else. You can, there are things that you can do to the WAV or in the mastering stage, in the knowledge that it will go to vinyl because vinyl has its own set of requirements like digital, like CDs. It has quite a, a big set of requirements because it's quite a, um, a specific yeah. format, as it were. It's rubbish. Uh, because it's Technically got speaking, a I love lot vinyl, of limitations, well, can, mechanical from what limitations. I can tell when we I had more vinyl in the 90s. Mm. Mm. I'm older than I'm older than I look, even though I'm quite I'm pretty old. Um, but I remember like in the 80s we had vinyl, but we also had all these separate stack units. Mm. Is that is it important for vinyl? Does, does vinyl need more e, like post EQ like on a hi-fi system or is it no? No. Okay, cool. No, <laughs> that's that D different vinyl decks can sound different. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's there's an EQ curve built into the thing, so there's yeah. a pre-emphasis and a de-emphasis EQ curve going onto the disc and coming yeah. off. But that's kind of built into the I that's think the phone. To do with stage. the mechanics of the pro of the yes. okay. yeah, exactly. So and then different cartridges will sound different. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 no. no, so, um, no. And people like buying things like valve amps and all yeah. the rest of it because it's fun and because yeah. some people like the way they sound or you know, and there are differences between them and all the rest of it. But it's not a requirement. Right. It's just something that's okay. cool. Okay. So if someone so this might be a a mixing question or a mastering question, but if I was producing, say, electronic music, um, and I like to use stereo basses, mm -hmm. is that okay? <laughs> or is it not? Uh, it's not as simple as a yes or no answer. Yeah. If you wanted something that was 100 minutes long of continuous music, that's a ridiculous example because you yeah. obviously couldn't fit that on one side of vinyl. <laughs> if you wanted something that was 25 minutes long, on one side, and you had this ridiculous, this wide, sorry, great stereo bass, uh, and it was really squashed and compressed sounding, you know, really harsh high frequencies. All of this together would mean that probably the one factor I have left <laughs> without delving into the specifics of music is level on vinyl. So I would have to turn it down loads in order to make it fit um, because vinyl is limited to a four inch radius of space. So right. anything. You've got to fit the grooves into the. It's got to fit some physical grooves that take up actual space into a fixed amount of space. So something that's five minutes long, you've got a bit more space to play with than something that's 25 minutes long. Okay. Because you're still trying to fit it into this one. So I'm kind of like a 12 inch space. single? Cutting a 12 inch single, yeah. So you can have stereo bass right. on vinyl, but also what you've got to remember is that. Uh, the way that vinyl uh, is cut and picked up is with one needle. Mm -hmm. uh, and so stereo information is when the waveforms, it's just a waveform on disc, is out of phase, as it were. So the two channels are doing something different. And so to, to create that movement, the one stylus has to move up and down. So if you have something that's really extreme, that one stylus has to move up and down. It's going to bounce. In an extreme manner, and then it, um, it could bounce. jumps out the right. roof. Oh. Or it could yeah. burn out the cutting head if the. Or if it's super high frequency. Yeah. So, so the, this is the technical, these are the 
limitations that that one has to take into account. What I would say is that as a cutting engineer, that's my job to take it into account. It's okay. probably again depends on the relationship, yeah. but it's even, my even job if to I'm inform. doing a master that I know is going to vinyl, mm. I wouldn't worry about that. No, exactly. Because okay. I know that. Well, I would warn the client because yeah. there are some places that will just try and cut a disc without an engineer yeah. being involved, mm. and that's when you get a vinyl disc where the last third of it is blank because yeah. it's just yeah that nothing has been optimized yeah. so i would always say don't do that go to somewhere where there's a cutting engineer who you could talk to who's going to do your test pressing all that stuff but i would still trust that person to get all of the things that sicily's talking about right so that's been, so this brings me to my last question and it is about vinyl if vinyl if vinyl was to suddenly make a comeback and some some people claim it is depends on your age i think some people like to buy vinyl um is the manufacturing industry really still there for it is is, is the infrastructure still there for it uh, the infrastructure is there for a huge amount of vinyl at the moment, and it's there's a lot. Isn't it? There's a company made. start making new lathes. Is that right? I I I think so. Because there, there was a problem that there were just a finite number of cutting lathes yeah. in the world, yeah. and that they were gradually dying. Yeah. There is a yeah. There are certain bottlenecks in the whole right. process, and one of them is that we're still cutting on the most recent, the highest tech lathes were ones that were built in 1986. Right. I think, or you know, yeah. around then. Um, were, were they, are, are the, these things that were maybe salvaged from the vinyl factory when it shut down, or are these things? Of that, globally, lots right, of places. Right, There's lots okay. of random places that people have found them. My and dug them out. mate Nick Watson um, has moved out. The runs fluid or mm. works at Fluid Mastering. They moved out of London, um, and he sold his lathe, and they made I can't remember twice as much selling it as when they bought it uh, yeah, ten years ago. Yeah, you right. know, it's, yeah. So there is that. Manufacturing is currently a, a bit of a, because quite a few factories did stay open, but lots of them shut. And the capacity is currently not, not quite managing to make it up to demand, which is why at the moment, if your you know, favourite band is releasing an album, you might find that the vinyl releases like six to 10 months or a year, like right. it's, it's delayed because you call the factory and you say, we want to get it pressed as well as released and the lead times at the moment are nine months um, right. on getting the turnaround from, from, from just the cutting, booking it in, sending the master to the factory to getting your final um, final pressings. So yes, it is a bit of a mm. bit of a, yeah. uh, a But I think if the demand is there, then the industry would respond. Right. You but, know, that, that, yeah. That's gonna decrease because the pandemic had yes. an influence and there was a, mm. um, a huge fire somewhere, wasn't there? One of the plants yes. that you know damaged the, the, the global capacity. Right. Burnt down. One of the two lacquer factories. Okay. Burnt yeah. Down. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's sort of certain bottlenecks and certain thresholds, ceilings, um, but the capacity is pretty high um, at the moment. I mean, I think in market shares, I should don't know the numbers, but it's doing well yeah. uh, and it's increasing, um, okay. which is good. Great. Okay, just um, that was really cool. So let's see. I've that's all the questions I have now. Is there any questions from the floor, Dr. Campbell? Um. <coughs> I don't mean to monopolize the microphone, but um, I like microphones. Um, I'll just say. I hope you do, because you're, uh, you're <laughs> um, I just, uh, as you know, Ian, I w I've been involved in the loudness wars for many years now. And, and, and when I first started doing my research into it, um, there was, um, it is when Art 128 first started being researched and we started looking at loudness units and things like that. And, and we finalized, you know, quite a few years, a few years ago now, the standard of loudness units. Now, do you think in that time, because I've been uh, busy with other things, shall we say, since then, um, do you think that loudness units has improved I know sound quality is a subjective thing, but do you think it's improved the standards of what we listen to? Interesting question. Um, I think I'd probably say no, honestly, because um, nobody's paying any attention. Uh, you know, the loudness unit is, back in the day we had VU meters, the old needle meters. Then you had RMS meters, RMS is the maths that underlies the VU meter, but it, it, so it makes it more accurate, but it's still flawed because it's very sensitive to bass. And LUFS is better in that respect. Um, but they're all just ways of measuring the same thing. And people are still, you know, there are still albums coming out at minus four and minus six LUFS. 
Um, what I saw was it started getting really bad about 2000, probably peaked about 2008 in terms of almost everything was super loud and then things improved. Um, and there was a there was a fantastic year when we had um, the Daft Punk album and mm. Uptown Funk in the charts and, and lots of more dynamic stuff. And then we saw the, I, th- I thought when streaming services started turning loud things down, people would just stop bothering. That hasn't happened yet. Um, there was a question about standards earlier on that we were talking about in the, in the break. One of the interesting things about Atmos is this minus 18 LUFS requirement. And yeah, as I said in my talk, you know, back in the day I'd have said, oh, you can't have standards. But actually at the moment it's kind of working. I do anticipate there's going to be a loudness war in Atmos as well. The question is what the result will be. And hopefully, because Apple are now enabling sound check on all their new devices, so by default, if something's made super loud, you're not going to hear it that way. Even the people who try it will kind of end up thinking, oh, I'm not going to bother. But I don't know that that really has anything to do particularly with LUFS. You know, I mean, it, I know people in the broadcast industry who say it makes things harder for them. Mm. Um, so I think it's a, it's a two-edged sword. You know, it's a benefit because it, it, it... And the other disadvantage of it is people start thinking, oh, I have to aim for this number. You know, mm. they, they keep asking, what should I aim for? What should I, and it's like, well, it depends. Mm. Um, so, so I think, you know, it definitely it's a two-edged sword. So I've just been on my phone there. I wasn't being rude. I was looking something up. So you said around about 2007, 2008, people started changing. And I'm just looking at the release of Metallica's Death Magnetic, which was 2008. Does anybody know the, the story of the, the horrible sound of that album? Yeah, I'll just no. come I do. If there's a, if there's a co- is there a correlation? What's the, oh, what's well, the story I, of the... I blogged about it. Yeah. Are the, have we got time for this? Well, if, we, if we're in a nutshell, yeah. so they mastered it super, super loud. It was one of the loudest albums ever at that point. And a fan wrote to Ted Jensen at Sterling, who mastered it, and Ted sent him a private email saying, "Yeah, I'm not happy about it, but that's what they wanted." And the fan, without his permission, posted it on a Metallica fan site. Oh, wow. And I heard about it, and I thought, "Oh, that's interesting." Coincidentally, at the same time they had uh, licensed the songs on the album to be used in the Guitar Hero game. You know, the thing where you play along on a controller to try and score points by hitting the notes accurately. And the version that was sent to the Guitar Hero people, there were stems because they needed the guitar, bass, drums, vocals separately, was from a much earlier stage in the production process when the album wasn't super loud. In fact, it was actually quite quiet by modern standards. So the next thing that happened was people started saying, Guitar Hero sounds better than the CD. Right. And I read that and was like, nah. And then I took a listen to the clips that people uploaded. And I was like, oh, it does. <laughs> so I posted on my little mastering blog that had about 100 visitors a day. And I got 15,000 hits overnight. <laughs> wow. um, and then a couple of days later, Music Radar, which is the online bit of future music publishing, right, yeah. um, posted about it. And then Wired Magazine posted about it. And it ended up in The Guardian and The New York Times and The Wall Street Journal. Um, 20,000 Metallica fans signed a petition saying this record sounds terrible, you should remix and remaster it. Because wow. didn't they re- rename it Clipping Death? That was, that's one of the, yeah. Um, Andy Sneap, who's a famous metal engineer, um, remixed and remastered it from the stems, um, ripped from the Guitar Hero game. I mean, it was, it was wow. really interesting because you don't normally hear the comparison. It was the first time, I think, that anybody had, now, with Atmos, you can listen yeah, to the dynamic version of Dua Lipa and you can listen to the stereo version mm. of Dua Lipa, which is not dynamic. And you can make your own mind up. But back then, that, that comparison wasn't there. So, yeah, that kind of kicked off a huge publicity mm. frenzy yeah. and, um, yeah, kind of made my blog much more interesting right. to lots yeah. of people. I have lots of Metallica fans in my... Oh, yeah, okay. I'm glad great. I asked that. That was, a, that was just an afterthought yeah. while we were it talking. It kicked about. off my PhD as well. There we are. Mm, yeah. It has filtered a little bit, like, like the discussions through to... I do get artists more who are more involved in the kind of saying, actually, no, I would like a... Uh, a dynamic master like please you know I'd say is this right you need to check it against other things yeah. and if they actually would rather it was dynamic so there is I think some awareness it's not, it's not oh, no, huge, awareness is definitely great but there is yeah. definitely more discussion about it I think as, a, as an aspect of the, the whole production process which is nice but you still get people going ah nobody cares just make it loud you right. also get people who are you know big at a time when Squashing things, clipping them massively was important. Who will not accept anything right. less? And you get some you engineers who made their want. reputation making stuff super loud. Mm. Yeah. Um, who you know, 
want to are proud of that and yeah. want to. But then you do that, it. and and we, this could almost for ages, but, but we really have to wrap it up. But then you do that, and then you send it to a commercial radio station, and then yeah. they they put a horrible mm. amount of compression on it anyway, and it sounds like yep badness. <laughs> yeah, my opinion is there's a sweet spot, and there isn't a target. But for anybody here who's interested, I recommend get an LUFS meter. They're confusing because they have three different versions. It's another maybe a reason it hasn't been so successful. There's the momentary, which I think for music you can basically ignore. There's the integrated, which is an overall value for the song, which is kind of useful and is what the streaming services use. But why would you want, if you make like an acoustic ballad and a metal tune, both minus 14, mm. the acoustic ballad is going to sound way too loud because mm. it shouldn't be musically as loud as a metal tune. So that, that's why no targets. But... If you look at the short-term loudness, which is averaged over about three seconds, if you make the loudest bits of your stuff around about minus 10 or no louder than minus 10 and make them consistent and then balance everything else relative to that musically, I think you're going to be in great shape. You know, you will probably get turned down by two or three dBs on Spotify and YouTube and all the rest of it, but that's okay. You know, it's not a big deal. If you see stuff being turned down like five, six, seven, eight dBs, that to me is a missed opportunity because you could have made it more dynamic and had the benefit of that. Um, and if you want to find out what's happening to your music, you could go to loudnesspenalty.com, which is a site that I set up with meter plugs. Um, you just drag a file onto it, and it, it doesn't get uploaded. It's completely secure, and it will tell you what each of the streaming services is, go is going to do, and you can preview it. That's the important bit. It doesn't matter what the number is. Press preview and compare it to your favorite reference material and see whether you still like it. If you still like it, it's all good. But if you listen to it and think, oh, that's a bit disappointing based on what I was expecting, then you might want to go through the process cool. again. Cool. Right. We're going to have to wrap it up there. There's lots more we could have asked and there's lots more I'd like to ask, but unfortunately we haven't got time. But thanks very much to Cicely and Ian. Thank you.